we'll um we'll get this thing started. So, you know, thanks for everyone for jumping online again uh, for the second time out with the Kings session. Uh, you know, I've kind of got a pretty general kind of preamble for this type of stuff, but, you know, the primary purpose for this is to, is to help kids and, and families as well as coaches and fans by really just providing a bit of, a bit of an insight into whether it's professional coaches, professional players or our network of um, support staff. Um, and just like last week, I'd encourage you all to, to take notes, um, talk about the things that are discussed in this Zoom over dinner. Um, I mean, that's the best way, in my opinion, uh, to consolidate all of this knowledge and some of this learning. So, you know, please, like I've got my notepad next to me and I'll try and take as many notes as I can. Um, I promise you there'll be a, well, there will be a lot of value in some of the things that are said by these two people tonight, our guests. Um, so I guess, and the last thing is as well, I'd encourage you, um, there is a Q and A function uh, within the Zoom. Um, so if any questions kind of do come up that you want to ask, I'd encourage you to punch those in. Um, and then if we have time at the end to take on additional questions, um, aside from the ones that are submitted prior, we'll, um, we'll definitely take those on board. So, you know, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two guests. So with Brad Newey, current Sydney King. Um, and it was, it was interesting doing this research. I've kind of figured out that you've both been playing basketball for a very long time, which is super cool. Um, so Brad, you know, roughly 16 years, you've represented Australia to you know, world championships, Olympic games, um, and drafted by the Rockets, which is pretty cool, the 54th pick. Um, they are my favorite team. Fun fact for everyone that's listening. Sorry for anyone you. that's, sorry. I've been traded since. Yes, I know. I, I have seen you've been traded to, to the Lakers, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just waiting for my phone and call. You're waiting for your phone call, your opportunity. Um, and then our final guest is Natalie Hurst, a uh, 20-year professional player, recently retired, um, will be assistant coaching with the Adelaide Lightning. I, I hope that's official, Natty. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> um, um, yeah, awesome, awesome. And also represented Australia at World Championships and Olympic Games um, and is a seven times WNBL champion, which is unbelievable. Um, and, you know, as you're both aware, so the theme for tonight or the, the talking point to, for tonight is a letter to my younger self. And no, these two have not prepared a letter that they're going to read out. Um, the plan of attack will be to, to just ask, phrase a few questions around junior basketball, which probably relates to the vast majority of you on here. Um, phrase some questions around senior basketball, um, which will relate to a lot of you on here that have aspirations to play professionally or you know, whatever it may be, represent this country, go to college. Um, and then once we've kind of got through that, we'll take on those additional questions. So I guess to start with guys, and you know, just so we've got a bit of flow, we'll always start with, we'll just go Brad and then Natty, you'll kind of close us out. Um, so, you know, Brad, just to kind of give everyone here a, a kind of little brief snapshot of your playing career, not so much like, a, you know, at the age of 10, I started doing this, maybe more so uh, what are some of the, I guess, pivotal or memorable moments that have kind of popped up throughout your basketball career? And then you could perhaps guide us that way. Um, and then when you're done, we can get into Natty. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess uh, my kind of uh, basketball life, in a way, started when I was probably six to seven years old. My, my, both my parents played, my mum was a coach and these kind of things. And I guess from a young age, I kind of always had a ball in my hands, even before I could play uh, competitively. It had to be eight years old, but I would often train with the, my mum's team and we would get into fights and things like that. But uh, by the time I could actually start to play, she stopped coaching. So that kind of took away that, uh, parental kind of influence she had on me as a, at a young age, and I think that might have helped me going forwards because uh, um, you know if, you, if it was just your parent that coached you the whole time, it, it'd be a, a different way of looking at it. But um, you know, I had a kind of a slower junior uh, career start than what a lot of guys and, and girls normally have. It took me till I was probably a, a top age eighteen to to make a, a state side playing for SA Metro. Um, I'd been cut for almost three years in a row before that as the last cut before I finally made made it through. And I, I guess 
um, what kind of, you know, my motivation was, was, was always to get better to make the team the next year. And Cart didn't make it. And, you know, he would just kind of say to me, well, you know, make sure you, you keep on training girls too. Once they get cut from sides, they kind of, you know, they throw on the towel and say, I'll see you next year. Whereas I kind of used it as an opportunity because the coach said, keep on coming and training. You never know. And, uh, and we'll put you in, you know, that'll help you going forwards. And, when I was a bottom age 18, so I'd been cut from 16s both ages, and I made the bottom age 18. I was a reserve for the side, and I actually really improved um, training with the team. And, and at one stage, one of the guys on the team got got it, uh, in trouble at school, and he was my club teammate uh, playing at Forestville in Adelaide. And um, I knew he he was getting up to no good and these kind of things, and uh, it was kind of frustrating to me because you know I was doing the right stuff, trying to you know, make it as a young basketballer doing all my sessions, you know, looking after my body and these kind of things. And he, um, the coach said to him in the morning, you're not in the team anymore and we're going to take Brad away. So, you know, I was pretty thrilled. Like, unfortunately, like the guy was my mate. Like, we're still friends to this day. And, um, you know, I was pretty excited. And a few phone calls happened and these kind of things. And it was deemed that it was unfair that that could happen to that kid. And um, at, the end of the at the end of the session, the... Um, the head of basketball at the time uh, pulled me aside and said, look, Brad, we're really sorry. Um, we know we, we put you in the team. But we've actually got to take you out again because uh, it's not really fair to this kid. So you can imagine the emotions of, of, of what's happened to me as a 17 year old who hasn't made the team after trying out for three years in a row. All I've lived and breathed is basketball. Um, so I've kind of gone home and I said to my dad, like, you would not believe what just happened in the last three hours of my life. And, uh, you know, I think that moment there might have been the big trigger for me. And, uh, you know, from, from there, I'd, I'd gone from not making any state teams to playing on a, you know, a World, World Cup winning under 19 EMU team in Australia. And then going on and playing for the boomers and all those kind of other things. So um, I guess, yeah, a pivotal time in my mind. Um, you know, I was lucky enough that I'd always played as a guard as a kid and um, I had a huge growth spurt and that kind of helped me transition into becoming a, a really good senior men's player. And um, yeah, that's kind of, that, that were the moments that really, you know, kicked me along and got my my career going and I, I, it was just good to have my parents very supportive too that they weren't the kind of parents that you know would ring up the associations or you know ring up coaches and say why is my boy doing this and I, I think it's because they played the game too so uh yeah that, that's pretty much the the, the trigger as, at a young age and, and what, what got me got me going I guess awesome well thank you for that yeah no. didn't go too long did I no no you were good mate you're fine <laughs> Um, I guess similar to Brian, you know, I started playing when I was five. So I played under 10s for four or five years. Um, we were allowed to play back then. I think I'm a little bit older than Brad. So back then we were allowed to, to participate. So started when I was five and I never looked back. Apparently before that I wanted to play soccer or some other sport. Um, Mum and dad said, hey, give this a try. Mum and dad were both coaches. So I did and I played half a game of basketball. I think I cried for the first half. And then after that, mum and dad said, you know, couldn't get a basketball out of my hands. So I started like that. Um, played all three juniors in Canberra. Um, I'm an ACT kid, so grew up playing under 12s, 14s, 16s and 18s in Canberra. Um, then when I was in under 16s, my, my top age, so 15 turning, about to turn 16, I was lucky enough to make the squad of the Canberra Capitals. Um, very lucky that year. That was the year that Lauren Jackson and Kristen Veal came out of the AIS. So it was the, the year that the club started to rebuild. Um, they wanted some young local juniors and I was just lucky enough to be there, I guess, at the right time. And um, yeah, was added into that team and actually was, you know, won my first championship at 16. So really lucky to be involved in that. Um, still played ACT. I played, um, stayed and played in the ACT within the Waratah League. Um, whilst I was still playing WNBL. Um, so did all that and then got to, to 18 or 19 and decided that, you know, been doing it for a long time and actually took a couple of years off. Um, just wanted to go and kind of experience life a little bit. So went, went and did that for a couple of years and then at 21, 22, I uh, got the itch again. So worked back hard, got myself back into WNBL and, you know, hadn't looked back and, you know, it's been 15 years since then. So yeah, I've been lucky enough to 
to you know have a have a long career. Um, you know, I've had some setbacks. I've I've been in junior Australian teams. I actually am not a world champion or Olympian. I've been twice cut, glass cut, and the oh, same thing happened right. to me in juniors. I feel but horrible you know, those, for introducing you that way. That was okay. Um, but I think those moments they didn't you know define me is if I was good or not at my sport. Um, I plugged away. Um, I worked super hard, and I made a, a you know like you said a twenty year career out of out of you know all these knockbacks. Um, and I didn't let it, you know, let it stop me. I, you know, when, when it first happened to me, I said, okay. And I, I went and tried my, tried my foot in Europe and, you know, was lucky enough to play there for six or seven years. So I have, you know, there's been some pivotal moments where I could have gone, oh, this is just too hard. Um, I don't want to do this anymore. But, you know, I think those, those setbacks pushed me along to, to go, you know, I am going to make this and I am going to make it my, you know, my full-time job in my career. And, you know, as a female athlete, we've been lucky enough that in the last 10 or so years that we've been able to, to, to do that. So. Yeah, in a nutshell, that's that's basically my career. Okay, so it's it's kind of it's it's cool listening to both of you talk about your career in the sense that it was never. I made every state team, you know. I made every school team. We won all these games. We won championships. It very much seems like it was like that a lot of the time. And you know, it sounds like you had some really good people around you, so that when you were a junior and you were faced with moments of adversity and your, your resiliency was challenged, you had some really good people around you. And, you know, are there any kind of people that come to mind off the top of your head um, that, you know, it doesn't have to be a specific moment, but you always knew you could lean on during you know, certain difficult times to get you through, or there was always one person that you could always rely on for good advice, or even if there was just someone that, you know, you're faced with a pretty difficult situation and you just knew they had nothing to do with basketball and you can go to that person and, and have a laugh and they can distract you from, from these kind of tough moments? Yeah, I mean, like, the, the pretty obvious one in my life is my dad. And uh, even still to this day, you know, as a 35-year-old, I'll ring him, you know, every second day and get advice on from gardening to basketball, you know, anything like that. And, um, you know, I think that's a pretty typical kind of role model and you know probably my mum too because she, she was actually so you know I would look at her and her competitiveness and you know going and watch you know, in, in the, the competitions which kind of but I, I definitely lean on um switch did the switcheroo with me when i was now in the junior kind of ranks he um ended up being my school coach as well so like you know part of me was like this guy you know he, he let me down and he didn't want me in the team and then you know i'm doing you know indies with him when i should be doing maths <laughs> and he's helped me become a pro so um and in the end he ended up being my state coach and you know we, i went on to do pretty good things but, you know, uh, and another guy probably was Marty Clark when I finally, you know, got to the AIS. He's a guy that I was tough on me, but, um, you know, he said to me that the day I was trying to make the, you know, the Beijing team, and, and that happened. So, uh, you know, just, you know, bust, bust my, you know, bust my ass with him, doing all the extra work. Um, you know, my second year there, I, you know, I chose not to work and so well, if you're not going to work you're going to go and because you have a choice to go and get a job or, uh, or or study and i was like well i want to be a professional basketball player so well you're going to do the work that's needed to be one so i would do extra individuals and all these kind of things and you know i paid off and you know so they, they're probably marty clark and my parents are probably the main ones at, at a younger age and, and when i got into the pros ian stacker he was my first coach there as well so yeah. those th those four are pretty influential people um you know, mum and dad, obviously, you know, it's an obvious answer, but I was, you know, I was really lucky, whereas they were always supportive of whatever decision I made. So when I wanted to join a WBL squad so young, you know, they were supportive. When I wanted to stop and take, you know, step away, they were supportive. When I wanted to come back, they were supportive. So even though they grew up they were, with basketball, they were coaches, it, there was never any pressure on me, you know, to take that, that road. And they always just supported what I wanted. So I've got them. Um, Kelly Abrams. Um, when I was 13 years, I know most people, you know, probably forget that name, but, you know, she was a, a great player, the WNBL. Um, she actually captained Canberra for six or seven seasons. Um, when I was 13 years old, 
they had a program in Canberra, uh, Big Sister Little Sister. Um, I was lucky enough that it was her first year out of the AIS and they assigned her as my big sister. Um, so, you know, I got to kind of watch her from a young age and just watch how she did things. And when I started to, to make my way up and, and made the squad where, you know, she was the captain, she kind of took me under a wing a little bit and just kind of showed me the way, you know, such a young athlete and, and what I needed to do. And um, when after I'd stepped away from basketball and I came back, uh, Jess Bibby had joined Canberra. Um, and I just looked at her and I was like, she's an athlete. She can shoot the ball like no one else I've ever seen and, and just really driven. And I said, you know, I need to partner up with someone like that and I need to learn really how to train and what I need to eat and what, what exactly I should be doing to, to make this, you know, a professional job. Um, so I followed her around for, for five years and I, I literally did, when she went to the gym and she lifted, I did the same, I shot the same, you know, I ate the same and I just copied what she did because she'd been, she had such a, such a successful career and she, you know, she'd come back from a back injury where she'd been out for two or three years, um, told that she might not walk and came back and played. And I said, this is just someone that I need to kind of follow around and, and, and do what they did. And it's not reinventing the wheel. It was just, you know, copying what works. And, you know, so she, you know, she played a massive part in, in you know, my career. So then in, I guess this is where it starts getting interesting. So in hindsight with, and we'll talk about junior basketball specifically. So, you know, rep basketball, you know, up to the age of 18, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, would you do anything different? So like these, you've kind of outlined some of the things that have stood out for you, you know, upon reflection that were important moments in your junior basketball career that were important people. Um, is there anything that you do different? Uh, you know, would you change something slightly or is there nothing and you're pretty content with the way you went about things um, as a junior, if you could have your time again? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, like I spoke kind of my, my journey at a younger age and perhaps if I had been just fed everything, you know, with this, like easy, mm -hmm. it, it may not have come off as, as well as it has. Um, yeah, there might be certain things like I was branded as like I was small, I guess, and like you know, I was skinny. Maybe I could have done a little bit of extra work in the gym. I, I guess you know, if you're 15 or 16. Um, I mean, I, I think, yeah, it's a difficult one to answer, really, because, you know, like, like I said, like if I hadn't had the setbacks, I, I don't yeah. think things would, would, have, would have happened the way they were. Maybe, um, I guess I, I was always a pretty confident kind of bloke, and I, I think that came from, you know, having, having those setbacks. And, you know, at, at, and at times, you know, when I moved, you know, out of home, there was a little period at the start there where, where I was a bit, you know, nervous about things and maybe I could have just been a little bit more aggressive in my nature. Like I got called into a squad, you know, from that under 18 carnival to be with all, you know, the main guys like you know, Damian Martin, Andrew Bogus, Stevie Markovic, Aaron Bruce, uh, Alex Marich. And I, all of a sudden I've gone from, you know, playing on a Saturday morning, you know, Pasadena High School in Adelaide to being on the national level. And maybe if I had to come in a little bit more aggressive there, I might have been, you know, straight into it. But I got there eventually. But if, if anything, maybe, yeah, my first period of time when I, when I moved to Canberra, I could have been a little bit more assertive about, about the way I went about things. But, um, I, you know, it, funny enough, um, what I did is I, I you know, unfortunately, uh, uh, someone in my family passed away. So I went home for, for a weekend and kind of that kind of flipped the switch a little bit and kind of went back. You know, and then I was much more confident. So, um, yeah, if I was to say anything, maybe just, you know, t t carrying that confidence over from, you know, from being the kind of the man at Forestville yeah. in the 18s to into the, into the senior squad straight away. But, you know, I got there eventually. But it, it, that, that's probably the only yeah. real thing. And maybe, you know, a few, you know, physical kind of things. But like I said, it's hard to, it was hard to do that at that age. Yeah, I agree. I think as a junior, there's not a whole lot that I change, you know, I always had the ball in my hand. I was always shooting. I was always doing the right thing. You know, I think kids have a lot more access to, to training programs, to nutrition, to all that nowadays than what I probably had back then. So I would probably pay a little bit more. If I had had that, I probably would have been able to use that, you know, a little bit more to my advantage. But as a junior, I think I, I did what I could. Um, you know, I'm kind of with Brad as 
the confidence thing for me, probably I wish I had have taken that from my juniors and carried that into my senior career. Um, I think that things may have gone a little bit differently um, for myself if I could have felt how I felt when I was a kid, when I was a little bit older. So, um, but as a junior, I think that just, you know, if, if people are offering things, if, if you can do extra training with the coach, if you, if they're offering you nutrition, if they are offering you a way to, to show you how to get your body in shape and ready for senior programs, then, I, you know, I'd, I'd grab that. But, you know, back when, when I was a junior, there wasn't a whole lot of that. So I just think, you know, working hard and, and just like loving, loving what you're doing and loving the game and, and just loving hooping. That was, you know, that was me when I was a junior. So I'm, a, I'm not a professional athlete, nor have I ever been. So I've only read about professional sportsmen and sportswomen. Um, and I think the, the coolest thing for me so far is you guys say, no, I wouldn't actually change any of the setbacks or difficult times that I had to, to go through when I was a young player. Um, because that's kind of made me who I am now. And all the research would kind of suggest that any successful kind of athlete had to, to fight tooth and nail for that and had to deal with great adversity at a young age. And, you know, context is everything. So, you know, it might be a state team for you, Brad, but it might be something else for Nat. And I think that's kind of really cool. And, you know, there's one thing kind of to take away out of this for everyone that's listening is it is normal to fail or not make a team or get cut from something or, you know, say you're not good enough. It's, I think it's, it's one of the most common things that are going to happen for any young athlete and to kind of hear you guys talk about it. So casually, I guess is really cool and uh, reassuring to an extent. Um, but if we were to kind of dive into senior basketball now, um, I mean, you've both done a lot, but you know, in a nutshell, I mean, like what are the kind of really cool things that stand out for you guys for what you've been able to experience in senior basketball? Oh, I think, um, you know, personally, as a, you know, when, when I had that meeting with Marty Clark in my, my first you know, month or so at the A.S., and he said to me, you know, you, you could be an Olympian by this time. And um, I, I guess hearing my name called it and ticking that box was pretty satisfying. And um, the, the challenge for me then on was to maintain it. You know, a lot of guys have gone on to, to make teams and, you know, do well in their first year in the NBL or whatever, or wherever they play and they, they kind of they fall off, fall off, you know. And uh, I, I think what, what I'm really proud of is my ability to be able to maintain a, a level of skill, um, you know, for, for this amount of time. And uh, I, I just put that personally down to my training you know, habits and my social habits. Um, you know, to be a successful professional at times, um, your social life, you know, takes a bit of a hit. Um, and I just think, you know, there's things that ha have happened in my life that have kind of had to sacrifice a little bit uh, for, for the greater good. Uh, believe me, I, I still have a great social life, but um, there are the proudest kind of moment of my professional life is, you know, being able to maintain uh, you know, my, my skill level. And, and I just put that down to things that I've learned from coaches over the years. And um, like, like we said before, I enjoy working on my game and you know, look, looking at guys. And you know, I came into the league and, and I was playing with Robert Rose and, you know, John, really, Robert Rose was twice my age. He was 41 years old. I was 19. And he was the hardest trainer in the team. So in my head, I'm like, well, he's doing that. He's twice my age. Why aren't I doing that? And, and I think... That's kind of what I've taken now as I've gotten, I'm moving into, I'm not 41 years old, but I'm moving into the, you know, the second half of my you know, 30s. And that's something I'm, I'm kind of trying to do with the younger players now. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a process, but yeah, basically being able to maintain things throughout my professional life is probably what I'm the most proud of. Um, I think for me, you know, I've been, you know, lucky enough to win seven championships, but I've been involved in some great teams and I've got to play with some great players and not just like teammates, but mates and, and friendships that I've been able to keep over the years. And um, I think being part of those teams and, and enjoying success with those teams and then they're not just your teammate, like I said, they're your, they're your mates at the end of the day. Um, that's something that, uh, you know, I've got memories with almost every single player that I play with and, you know, great memories and things that I'll never forget. So I've been really lucky in that respect. And I think just having this as a job and it taking me all over the world and, and getting to experience other cultures and, and see places and, you know, eat different foods and, but then also do what I love and play basketball. Um, I think I've been really lucky to 
to be able to do that and, and, and to make it a full-time job and to, you know, I'm traveling in these countries and you know, getting paid for it and, and enjoying myself. And, you know, I just sit back at the end of the day and go, wow, this is, you know, this is a really great job and I wouldn't, you know, change anything to, you know, I don't want to sit behind a desk from nine to five. Like I, I love that I can be able to basketball and, and get paid for it and, and get to, you know, experience all these wonderful things. So I think the people that I've met and that I've played with, are, you know, a big thing that, I will, you know, that's probably the biggest thing that will you know, hold closest to my heart at the end of the day is, you know, when I retired, you know, a few months ago, that was the one thing that I sat back and reflected on. And I feel like I've been really lucky to, you know, like I said, be around those people. Awesome. I, mean, I kind of wish I could ask you more questions and kind of keep talking, but I think it's only fair that we kind of go to some of these submitted questions. Um, so the first one's um, the first one's from Opal Bird, and she wants to know what would be the one piece of advice you would give to your younger self. I think I know Opal's from Manly, right? Yeah, Opal is from Manly. Yeah, she had a really great camp at the. She um, did indeed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good question. I can see her, yeah. Um, the one thing I would probably like, I kind of, you know, hit it before, you know, like like Nat kind of got to I, I kind of envy um the kids coming through now because they've got you know there's a lot of research and, and new ideas and i i guess you know maybe buying into to, to, to new things that might get you know suggested like your nutrition or you know your proprioception to prevent ankle injuries or you know general s and c type things um i guess if i was to if I'm writing a letter to my older self that I've started to really benefit from, it's things like Pilates and yoga that I've started to do in the last couple of years. So if that, perhaps if those things were available when I was, um, you know, 16 to you know, that, that kind of age group, maybe I would have uh, gone down that path and not been too cool for school. That's the main thing. Don't be too cool for school. And at times <laughs> that, that, that happens a lot, a lot in that age group, but yeah, yeah, that's that I would, I would do that. Um, I think mine would be be a little bit kinder to myself. Um, there's a, a really fine line between a bad game and a good game. And I think that being able to be, not have those big ebbs and flows of highs and lows um, and then preparing for your next match, I think that would be the one thing that, you know, I would probably say to my younger self is that y your, your bad game isn't that far from your good game and your good game's not that far from your bad game. There's... Like I said, it's it's pretty even if you if you go back and watch a video on yourself. So that would be one thing that I would you know not to let myself go to those lows and then go to the highs and then come back. I think it, you need to try and try and maintain you know like the level head and yeah, that would be one thing. Also, I think too like uh, you know I kind of look at that being hard on yourself. Um, it wasn't until I was probably you know 32 I, I missed out on going to Rio and I was speaking to a lady independently from the Kings and she uh, did a bit of work with the Giants uh, football club and I would you know, say to her, I'd tell her some of my training habits and, and she would kind of say what why do you do that and I said oh it just makes me feel better like if I don't get that target I don't feel good and she's like you don't need to do that like you just but then that would that really was one thing that really would mess with me I had to do a certain amount of things in a row and I would get so like broken doing these things and, you know, I was quite hard on myself in those habits. And, and at times that would come out in my game. Too old to kind of, you know, speak to someone and pick things being hard on yourself. Probably, yeah, it, it, it adds a bit more juice to that answer, I guess. Yeah. Um, so the second question is from Jesse Edwards. It, he wants to know, how did you or how do you maintain focus when playing in front of hostile crowds? So given you've both played a lot of basketball, I can only begin to imagine, at least, especially in Europe, the types of crowds that you may have played in front of may be a little bit different to the WNBL or the NBL. So what's the process that you guys go through when you're preparing for a game where you know the crowd is going to be hostile? Um, well, I was lucky enough to play in Greece, which was like the mecca of crowd violence. Um, I, I, I guess the one thing I would kind of say, like when I was overseas, I was like, I don't know what they're saying. I don't really care. Like it doesn't affect me. So I would just kind of play through. I, I knew some things, but um, I, I guess the focus, it's probably one of the things I've done quite well. I've never really got 
annoyed at fans or bought into that kind of crap. Um, if anything, you just turn them into... I, I actually think the more they talk crap, they're actually feeding... They're not helping their own team because we're going to try But we hear it. Like, we're going to go a bit harder. So, um, yeah. So, motivation kind of get me back on track at times it can actually be harder to play affecting this and you, you're not give you that little kick so um I... all done yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry you cut no, out no, no, <laughs> you cut out you couldn't, yeah. couldn't tell what happened um you know i, I think similar to brad you know overseas you, you can't understand what people are saying um but I feel like if someone's, you know, wasting their time trying to get you off the game, it's because you're doing something good. I feel like it's the same if you're being booed. It's because you're doing something good. Um, so I used to love it. I, you know, go ahead and waste your energy on me and it would rev me up. Um, you know, so those kind of things, you, if you can flip it and use it as a positive and if you can use it to motivate you and watch your team get on top and you, you, you look over and you give a little wink and you know you've won. Like you haven't just won the team battles, you've won that little battle too. But I, like I said, I feel like if someone's wasting their time trying to heckle or you're being booed, it's because you're doing something good. Exactly. Okay, so you use it as ammunition. <laughs> awesome. Um, so this next one's from Lachlan Clegg. Um, and he wants to know, from 13 years old and onwards, what type of time did you each personally invest into your basketball training? And in hindsight, do you wish you had done more or less or would you change anything? Um, do you want to go first, Nat? Because I'm kind of hogging the strike every time I go first. It's okay. Go for it. Uh, <laughs> go for it. Um, I guess um, I was – what what probably one thing uh, my mom kind of got me into, I, I played tennis as well. So what that did, it gave me like a little bit of an outlet that I wasn't just basketball, basketball, basketball. I was do I, I would go and do you know extra other sport, and also played a bit of golf too. And um, so from 13, yeah, I, I would you know I'd practice tennis once a week and, and played in the junior circuit uh, after my basketball was done. And I think that's really important for for any kid um, is to not just. Okay, you got your favourite sport, but have just something else there that you, you know, take your mind off things a little bit. And funny enough, the footwork that I learnt there actually really carried over into my basketball. So um, as, as far as my training load as an under 14, you know, I, I probably... Be... ...practices and, and a little bit of school stuff. And then I was lucky enough to be in a squad where we would do it. The big thing when you're kind of 13 is you outside or down at the park, getting shots up and that kind of stuff is, is more as opposed to the structured, you know, training sessions. And um, they're, they're things that I really try to, you know, preach to you know, any kind of kids that I meet, you know, through high school, primary school, whatever, is, you know, really get into your parents or whoever your care is and say, oh, can you get me a hoop? Or I probably, they probably get annoyed at me, but... Um, just to have that little thing to, to go and, you know, have a few shots. At that. It's not controlled, but if, if you know you love doing that, you know you're going to be fine when it becomes, you know, more of a serious environment. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, 13 is a pretty young age and trying to think about 13 is over 20 years ago for me. So I can't exactly remember what I used to do back then, but I assume it would just be club training, a club game, a rep training, and then maybe one other session with a coach um like an individual type session where you can you know one coach can be super specific with things that you you need to improve on um like brad i played tennis as well when i was younger um and dad was a footwork coach so i would you know go out and do a lot of the, the footwork and the, the finishes around the bus and all that kind of stuff like i wasn't too interested in shooting a three-pointer and trying to put the ball between my legs and behind my back and, and make an all-world play back then um it was all about the simple things for me and i think like Brad said, if you can just get some extra shots up during the week, uh, work on your technique, um, you know, and, and have fun with it, then it doesn't need to be so structured. I think we're putting too much pressure on kids at, at such a young age now that we forget that basketball is bloody fun and we need to, you know, make sure that we're enjoying it, when, especially when we're younger. So uh, at what age then for the, for the two of you did you decide 
all right, this is something I want to take a little bit more seriously now and invest a little bit more time into. Um, and at that point, you know, what did a, you know, to the best of your best part of your memory, what did an average kind of week look like from a basketball perspective? Um, I reckon I was probably halfway through a year 11 <laughs> and uh, my, uh, my schoolwork wasn't going great. And um, it was only because I was putting in so much time and I, I was lucky enough that my, my mum and dad, they were kind of like, well, he's kind of backing himself a little bit. So we're not going to be on his, on his ass too much, which probably all, any, all the parents on here would be like, quick, hang up. Like he's saying the wrong thing. But um, I, I guess, you know, my, my timeline kind of would look like a, you know, you, you'd be in two, you know, you'd be in your rep team. I don't know, in SA, there, there was only rep, there was no kind of club ball. So you would train twice a week, you know, on your, you know, Tuesday, what it was a Wednesday night and Sunday, you'd do, you know, your rep training. You play your rep game Friday night. Um, I was in a, like a special kind of squad on a Thursday. Then I, you know, I do kind of a few individual sessions with my with my rep coach, you know, either one or two a week. Um, even you know, I'd do training Sunday morning, then go back on the Arvo and do a shooting session with him, and he really helped me out quite a bit. And uh, also, you know, my my school coach, I was lucky enough, he he was the state coach as well. So we would get like instead of me going to <laughs> maths or English, we go and, you know, get 200 threes or something like that. And, like, at the end of the day, it, it paid off for me, but not, not all kids it would. But, um, you know, I was pretty much doing something every day. And, um, you know, I guess I didn't go out or anything on the weekends with all my other mates because, you know, I was helped me as my friends were. were you know, they, they knew what I was up to and, and now we still see each other and, you know, it's like nothing's changed. So... I guess, you know, I, I used my rest times, you know, to the best I could. And, you know, I had a little part-time job I was doing as well. So that kind of kept me a little bit distracted as well. So, um, yeah, so most days I'd, I'd be doing something and, you know, even little footwork drills that I kind of adopted over the years and these kind of things that I'd learn about, I would do at home, you know, when I wasn't doing anything on that day. Um, I think with me, um, even though I, I started WNBL when I was so young, I still didn't kind of understand what it took to, to make it. Um, you know, I was part of great teams and obviously I was, I was the one on the bench back then. So I was, you know, I was, I didn't have, they didn't rely on me. Um, you know, they relied on me to practice, but when it came to games, so, you know, I didn't have the pressure on me. So I didn't kind of understand what I really need to do to make the next step. Um, I think at the end of year 12, you know, I decided not to, to continue studying and I, you know, I got a full-time job and so then you know I'd, I'd either get up early and do an indie I'd go to work and then I'd go to WML practice or I'd get to work super early so I could finish work um, I'd do an indie and then I, I'd train and I'd do that most days and then after WML practice I'd go and lift um, you know because until the last 10 years of my career I had to work a full-time job to make a living um, so I'd have to squeeze in four lifts, you know, three indies and, and, and training and, and work all in, in, in a week and then play at the end of the week. Um, obviously, when you become a professional, you can do a little bit, you know, you can do all that, but your, your day is not so, not so busy and you have time for, time for recovery and all that. So, you know, when I was, when I was a pro, I, I, you know, I'd shoot four times a week. I would lift four times a week. I'd, I'd do my, my team trainings and then I'd, I'd, you know, recover towards the end of the week and get ready to play on the weekend. Um, so, you know, it, it seemed like a lot, but because I went from not doing a whole lot, I, I feel like there was a, a period in my life where I just, you know, probably overdid a little bit because I was trying to trying to catch up. And, you know, once I started realising that this is what I wanted to do for a job, I felt like that's what I had to do. And, you know, obviously towards the end of my career, that, that kind of tapered off as, as to, you know, what I, what because I'd done so many reps for 10 years, I was like, well, I don't, at the end of my career, I don't need to do that. I don't need to shoot 500 shots a week. You know, I've done all the work early in my career that, um, you know, the last three or four years, you, you know what, what prepares you and that's, you know, that could just be 100 shots twice a week, you know. So there was a chunk in my life where I would do a whole lot, um, but that was, you know, I was young and I was able to, and I was able to cover and, and get that done. But so I went kind of nothing to a lot to then tapering off to, to get to the end of my career. So I guess it's it's quite clear that when uh, you both decided that, you know, I want to give this basketball thing a crack, um, there's additional time invested into basketball. But time's a finite resource. There's not an infinite amount of it. So 
you know, as you both are very well aware, where you add, you must subtract. So there are certain sacrifices that you obviously both had to make. And, you know, aside from the obvious ones, like, you know, I couldn't go to parties or I couldn't hang out with my mates as much anymore. You know, not just junior basketball, really your whole career. You know, if some of these kids on here have aspirations to play professionally and those types of things, what are some of the sacrifices that, you know, not look forward to, but, you know, they might have to prepare themselves to make eventually down the track. Yeah, um, I guess I was lucky enough that I, I was presented opportunities to go play in, in better leagues overseas at a very young age. I was 21 years old and uh, I accepted a contract to go play over in Greece. And, um, you know, that's that's a pretty big moment in most young guys' lives. That's when they're hanging out with their friends and, you know, they're all turning 21 and all these kind of things. And, I, you know, here I am just sitting in an apartment under a flower shop in, you know, <laughs> South Athens. Um, you know, kind of that that was a big decision I had to make. And, you know, I spent, me and my wife, you know, we spent our whole 20s in Europe pretty much. So um, I, I think that's a, a big thing that I had to do. And, you know, it's funny, now we're back here, we, we're, we're meeting friends now because like, we our friends are over there. So that, that's been a bit of a challenge that I, I've had to face. And um, I, I guess... Yeah, you probably friendships is one thing you, you're going to have to to if if you want to get somewhere pretty high level, you, you might have to you know unfortunately now it's much easier now with you know your FaceTime and all this kind of stuff and Instagram or whatever gram you use, um, you, you can stay in, in touch with people that way. But um, that, that's one thing that you know myself and my, and my wife because she, she came with me when I, when I went over at such a young age, and it's probably why I stuck at it for, for so long. I had her pretty much looking after me full time. So, um, so yeah, that, that, that's probably the big thing that you got to you know understand is you're going to have to you know deal with something, and uh, how how you manage with that will, will define you you know how, how your career goes. And um, it was an opportunity I took, you know, and I, I don't look back. Um, you know, the way the NBL was at that time, it, it, it was more in, in incentives for me to go overseas, and you know, I, I made a pretty good living out of it. So. Um, yeah. Oh, you know, like Brad said, you know, there's ways to call home now that are a lot easier than you could back then. But, you know, one thing that really hit me is when I first started going back overseas is that life goes on for all your friends back home um, and you're not a part of it. And you get back and things have changed. Um, and that's just the way it is. Um, I think I, that was a, one of the hardest things that I found is I'd leave and, you know, one thing would be one way and I'd come back and things would be different. Um, and it took me a while to understand that. But, you know, people's lives go on. You know, you, you miss weddings, engagement parties, birthdays, all those kind of things. And whilst it does suck, you still got to remember what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, you know, it's a, it's a great job to have. So, it, you know, it, it can be hard at times. Um, and, you know, it, it's not easy living away from home and, and having to do everything, you know, over social media and, and, and Skype back home. But, you know, it, it is worth it at the end of the day. And, you know, you get back in it and you come back home and you're back in normal life. And, you know, some things don't change and you get back and you just slot straight back in. But, yeah, that was probably the hardest thing that I found is, you know, life went on without me. And I just had to find my way back in when I, you know, when I returned home. Brad, Nat, that was phenomenal. Thank you both <clears throat> very much for your time and your willingness to share. That was an, an absolute treat. I know for me um, personally, like, you know, Brad spent a bit of time around you this past year trying to get to know you and, and that I've kind of had, you know, you might not know this, but Christine kind of tells me all about you all the time. So <laughs> it's actually kind of nice to speak to you both and hear about your careers and pivotal moments and things you do differently. So, you know, thank you both for your time. Um, and everyone else that's on here, thanks for jumping on. Um, we'll be back on next week with Kevin Lish and Geordie Hunter. Um, and the theme will be what it means to be a professional athlete. And I think with Kev, that'll be phenomenal. I think in, in, in my eyes, and I'm sure a lot of us could agree here, he's a consummate professional and just a really nice guy. So it should be, uh, it should be awesome. So once again, Brad, Nat, thank you both. Really appreciate it. Everyone else that's online, thanks for jumping on. We'll see you next week. See ya. See ya.